what happened on this island after they arrived has intrigued archaeologists for centuries. We know the islanders carved close to a thousand massive stone figures instilled with the spirits of their ancestors. We know they moved them, possibly as far as 12 miles, and placed them on sacred platforms called Ahu. But we don't know how they did it. According to island lore, the statues, called Moai, had simply walked into place. But how could a people who had no metal tools carve such imposing figures? How could prehistoric farmers who didn't have the wheel move enormous statues up to 30 feet tall and weighing close to 82 tons? Transportation of the Moai and Easter Island is perhaps one of the most important archaeological problems we have. It's the biggest mystery. Sergio Rapu was born and raised on Rapa Nui and served as governor for six years. Also an archaeologist, he's long championed the idea that the statues were moved in an upright position. It is to us to build hypotheses and go after looking for the attributes on the statues that allow an explanation that they were moved vertically. Archaeologists Terry Hunt and Carl Lippo are heavily influenced by Sergio Rapu's theory. The key to proving it, they hope, is inside this box. Here it is. It's a huge crane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This is going to be sort of scary to see it come out of there. It's so enormous. <laughs> wow. I don't know if I'm going to feel better or worse when I see it, because the box is big. And um, <laughs> we're going to move it with a small number of people. Um, Holy cow. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is amazing. Perfect replica. You know what? Yeah. This is making me feel sick to my stomach. <laughs> This precise replica of a Moai is the centerpiece of a simple but radical experiment being conducted in Hawaii by Lippo and Hunt. Over the next two days, working with a small group of volunteers, they will attempt to move this statue by walking it upward. When people ask, how did your ancestors move the statues? The answer was always, they walked. And for the Rapa Nui, that was the answer. And for the foreigners asking the question, they thought, oh, that's silly, you know, how crazy. What we're trying to do is, is evaluate our ideas, our, our ability to explain how they were moved, why the archaeological record looks like it does. So what we're going to do is tricky, and it could easily not work, and we've never done this before. Rapa Nui people had centuries to figure this out, and lots of people involved. To conduct this experiment, Lippo and Hunt will have just two days and 26 volunteers. The statue tradition was brought by voyagers from Polynesia to Rapa Nui. Throughout Polynesia, carved wooden and stone figures are common. But no other island can compare with the size or number of statues found here. According to oral tradition, the Moai were carved to represent the spirit of the islanders' ancestors. The statues are the living face of our ancestors. In order to look living, you have to put the inlaid eyes on the statues. Some statues are topped with a red stone hat or a top knot called a pukau. The moai were cut from volcanic tuff, a porous stone made from compressed ash. Almost all of them were carved here at Rano Raraku a massive quarry inside one of the island's three extinct volcanoes. Littered around the site are statues in various stages of completion, some still emerging from the rock. The most common way of carving the Moai here is to carve around the face and the body, like awakening the statues from the rocks. To do this, carvers used very dense stone tools made of basalt like this one used by modern-day carver Umi Kai in Hawaii. What we're trying to do is just cut a design that we want to follow into the, the tuff. Umi Kai is using a replica of the same ancient tool called a toki to carve a small version of a moai eye socket into volcanic tuff. 
If I was to do this with a modern tool, and probably take maybe 45 minutes to an hour. This, this will take uh, maybe a, a whole day to two days. It probably take the team of 12 people a year to produce a moai of this side. Once the moai is completely carved, the back will be still attached to the mother rock with a keel. Eventually that keel will be perforated and some loose rock will be added under the back of the moai so it remains floated as they cut off and release it from the mother rock. After they finish carving, they slide it down, raise it at the foot of the hill, then they finish carving the back. At this stage, the moai was ready to be moved to a sacred platform called an ahu, known to be a place of religious ritual. There have been lots of speculation about how the statues were moved from crazy theories that they were shot out of the volcano to aliens moved them. But in modern research, there's been a whole family of ideas about using contraptions, um, yeah. using palm logs for tripods or sleds or rollers. According to several of these theories, the islanders used logs to move the moai. When University of California archaeologist Joanne Van Tilburg tried using a wooden sled to move a moai along wooden rails. It's similar to a traditional method Polynesians use to move canoes out of the water. Ultimately, the experiment worked, and it gained wide acceptance. But not everyone believes the log theory. The problem with these series is that they have not drawn on the evidence that we see on the moai, the statues themselves, on the roads. As they investigated the statues and the roads, they began to accumulate clues that they think will tell a different story. Building on another researcher's data and using satellite imagery, Hunt and Lippo have surveyed almost 20 miles of ancient roads. There are several roads that begin at the statue quarry at Baraku and go uh, along the south coast, some go north, some go across the center of the island. These roads were used to, to move Moai to every corner of the island. They think the network of roads may have been even larger, but the degraded road beds can be hard to find with the naked eye. So they're testing a drone equipped with a camera that will give them more precise observations. Three, two, one, go. Wow. wow. <laughs> we have satellite images coverage for the entire island, and we can see certain kinds of features. This gives us a way of integrating that at a level where we get incredible detail. The drone may help identify new roads, which can then be ground truthed with modern surveying equipment. Hunt and Lippo believe a crucial clue to how the statues were moved may lie in the slope of the roads, which they have measured, confirming the results of an earlier team. We found that the roads generally have a, a maximum of a three degree rise as they go uphill and then a maximum of about six degrees when they go downhill. The island is fairly hilly and the inhabitants understood that to move the statues, the roads would have to be leveled so that they had a consistent and fairly gentle grade. But how did they move them? To find out, Hunt and Lippo studied more than 50 statues that fell, apparently, while being moved. We noticed that the statues that were headed uphill away from the quarry had fallen on their back most frequently. We also found that when statues were heading downhill, they'd fallen on their face. Statues on flat ground were kind of 50-50, and we could see that there was a pattern here. We tested it statistically and realized that we had very clear indications that the statues were moved in a standing position. There was really no other way to explain that. This idea has the virtue of being consistent with oral tradition. In fact, the Rapa Nui language even has a word, neke neke, which translates as walking with no legs. For centuries, we have known that the Moai did walk, as our ancestors said. But how exactly they did the walking is what we, the archaeologists, are looking into. In fact, others have tried to move them vertically including Thor Heyerdahl and a Czech engineer named Pavel Pavel. 
This is the statue that uh, Pavel Pavel tried to move in 1986 with his experiments, uh, moving this, the statues in an upright position. By shuffling it across the surface, there was a lot of friction on the base. And as he did it, in fact, there was damage done to the base that removed material right down from the bottom here. We saw it. this can't really be quite right because the, the shuffling and the grinding could, isn't consistent with the, what we saw in the statue. So on the one hand, we were like, yes, they're moving standing up, but not exactly that way. To figure out a less destructive way to move them, they built on observations first made by Sergio Rapo, identifying differences between statues that made it to the platform and those that fell on the way. On the more than 50 fallen statues they analyzed, what researchers called road moai, the eyes hadn't been carved yet. They were left as sharp angled slots. According to Hunt and Lippo's measurements, road moai were chunkier, their bases were bigger, their centers of gravity were lower, kind of like a bowling pin. Most of the road moai had a D-shaped base, and the base was angled so the statue leaned forward. These were key features to Lippo and Hunt. The statues were rolled across the front edge. Uh, and that front edge has a characteristic shape, especially as the statues get larger, that allowed that to happen. The statues that made it to the Ahu platform show the difference. The eyes had been carved, their sides had been trimmed, and their center of gravity shifted back and up. They'd been cut so that their bases were no longer angled, but flat. They leaned forward, but not as far as road moai. They stood more upright, and they'd lost a little weight. Based on all these differences, the difficulties faced by the Czech engineer Pavel are understandable. Pavel was using a statue that had already been reshaped for a platform. The eyes had already been carved. It didn't lean as far forward, and its sides had been trimmed. Ultimately, the evidence for how the statues were moved can be found on the statues themselves. They were engineered to move, and the details of the statues are telling us about transport. But the only way to show that the statues could walk is to test the theory. To do that, they need to make a replica Moai, the most precise replica ever made. They collect data embedded in thousands of photos of two fallen Moai, one that fell on its back, and the other on its front, and enter it into a 3D modeling software. Industrial designer Max Beach then translates the measurements into data, which is used to make a mold for the statue. Their photos depict an 18-foot tall, 19-ton moai. Because of safety concerns and cost, they scale the replica down. Their statue will be 10 feet tall and weigh 5 tons, about the average of nearly 1,000 moai on the island. Hunt and Lippo nicknamed the statue Hotu Iti as a tribute to Easter Island's legendary first ruler. Max Beach is also creating an animation showing how Hotu Iti might move. Carl and I started with a small scale model to move it around on a table to get an idea of how would this thing walk back and forth. We felt that there was some challenges with scaling this up so we built a five-foot model out of wood that would allow us to see what some of the dynamics involved are as this model scaled up. Once it gets over that While this contraption doesn't look like a moai, the same principles of design and physics are still in play, like an accurate center of gravity and the rounded forward edge. It has enough of the features that gives us a sense when we pull it that it's going to behave something like what we expect. Uh, with the large statue. You need to get it up high enough so that it starts to fall. You're kind of pulling on its side, but you're also pulling it so that it wants to rotate. Bringing that center of gravity back over yeah. the... Okay. That's the point that the coordination is key. Yeah. There we go. That was a good step there. Good, good. Yeah, beautiful. In addition to understanding the physics of how the statue should move, figuring out where to tie the ropes is going to be critical in making the experiment with a larger replica moai a success. The trick is to pull it in the right 
direction with the right force at the right time that it rocks forward on the forward edge which has that rounded that D shape but will hunt and lippo's 10 foot tall replica moai behave the same way wow let it fall forward we are going to stay true to the original center of gravity Engineer James Didish is designing the mold for Hotu Iti, paying special attention to the center of gravity and how the statue is balanced. When I apply density to this model, it calculates the exact center of gravity and is saved in this coordinate system right here in the center. This is important because if the center of gravity was off, it could alter the uh, the way that these were moved. So if the experiment is to determine that these could be moved by walking them, then the center of gravity has to be at the same height as it was originally. The mold itself is comprised of four layers and made in two halves split down the nose. HO2 will come out of the machine with about uh, plus or minus 30 thousandths of an inch accuracy overall. This is incredible in comparison to any other recreations that have been made that have been mostly glossed over and symmetrical. This is nearly exact of what you could find on Easter Island. After nine hours of machining time, each half of the mold is fitted with an internal rebar structure to support the massive weight of the statue. When we are ready to pour the statue, we are gonna fill this thing with nearly six tons of concrete. What we'll see in this truck is the new high-tech mix that we've developed specifically for the Moai statue. It's lighter in weight, higher in flowability, it's more sustainable. If you look really close, see the little beads, the spheres? The beads are expanded polystyrene, a type of synthetic foam. Putting it in the mix adds volume without adding weight. That makes the statue closer in weight to a real Moai of this size, made from volcanic tuff. We're burying him to equalize that hydraulic pressure from the outside so it can't move. It took 10 days from the time the concrete was poured into Hotuiti's mold to the time the 5-ton, 10-foot-tall replica was carefully extracted from the ground. Trying to get this right and have him perform like the original Polynesians intended, that's what our mission is. There's a lot at stake in figuring out how the statues moved because it may cast light on the island's troubled past. There are vastly different ideas about what happened here. The story told by the islanders speaks of different clans and prolonged warfare. Fractured skulls from skeletons found on the island seem to confirm that. What would have brought on this violence? A widely accepted theory is that different clans around the island competed to build more and ever larger moai. Needing logs to move them, they cut down the island's lush forest to keep up with rivals. As the forest disappeared and resources grew scarce, the rivalry turned violent and the society descended into chaos. Some have described this as a case of ecocide. A culture bent on over-exploiting its resources spirals into cultural collapse and disaster. But is this a true picture of what happened here? Easter Island once looked very different. Pollen evidence shows that 25 various species of trees and shrubs once grew here and reveals a dramatic change as the island was deforested. Something pollen expert John Flenley attributes to human activity. Our pollen results were strongly indicating to us that people had destroyed the forest. In fact, it was the clearest example in the world that I had ever come across of deforestation by people. Throughout the island, excavations have revealed the impressions of countless palm root molds like these. This island once had a palm forest, and one way we know that is because of the preservation of these palm roots that document that there once was a palm forest, a very extensive palm forest across the island. These lines here, uh, these black lines, uh, trace the paths that the roots of the palm trees once made. 
But some scientists believe that the trees were cut down not in a frenzy of statue building and moving, but for the simple reason that these were farmers. These people were agriculturalists. They needed to clear land. So in a sense, the forests were largely superfluous to them. It's garden land that was essential to them, not palm forests that they couldn't eat. The whole notion that it was the cutting down of these trees that led to a collapse, if you will, of Easter Island is a bit uh, off the mark in my view. Archaeologist Pat Kirch studies human impact on island ecology. He's done a comprehensive study of the Mangareva Islands about 1,600 miles away. After the Pitcairns, they are the nearest islands to Rapa Nui and striking in their similarity. Both Mangareva and Easter Island were nearly deforested and both once had large colonies of seabirds whose guano fertilized the soil. But on both islands, people caught and ate nearly all the birds. When you eliminate those birds, you disrupt that nutrient flow. And we think that on both Easter Island and Mangarevo, the elimination of large seabird populations was a key factor in the inability of the forest to regenerate. The people also slashed and burned down trees to make way for farmland and combined with the loss of seabird fertilizer, put their forest in jeopardy. And there may be another factor. During excavations here at Anakana Beach, the site of the first settlement on Easter Island, Hunt and Lippo unearthed evidence identifying what they believe dealt a significant blow to the forest. Rats, possibly brought as accidental hitchhikers by the original voyagers from Polynesia. Hunt and Lippo believe these rats played a decisive role in the deforestation of the island. We didn't really see the full significance of that until we started to realize that rats as an invasive species in fragile environments like this would play a pretty significant role in stopping the regeneration of new trees. They would eat the seeds of the native trees, in this case the palm trees, and the palms would not regenerate as they had done naturally. This is the same species that was on Easter Island. This rat is originally from Southeast Asia and has spread through most of the Central and Western Pacific. Will Pitt is a wildlife biologist at the USDA Wildlife Research Center in Hilo, Hawaii. This is a female Polynesian rat. In the wild, a lot of these rats only have about a year life expectancy. But a female like this could produce four litters a year. When introduced to areas with abundant resources and no natural predators, the first generation of rats could, in theory, have exploded to millions in just a few years. Even a fraction of that number would consume a huge amount of food. And it turns out that the food that the rats ate was palm nuts, inside of which are the seeds that would spawn a new forest. Throughout the island, remnants of palm nuts show gnaw marks from rat teeth, supporting that argument. The role that these little Polynesian rats may have played in, in deforestation is a very interesting one and a little controversial. It's a disruptive force ecologically, but I'm skeptical that it was the sole or major force. And the reason I say that is rats were transported to every island across the Pacific, but not every island got deforested. So it had to be a combination of some other factors along with rats that led to deforestation. The forest was likely wiped out by a perfect storm of human impact slash-and-burn farming, decimation of the seabird population, and the introduction of an exploding rat population on the island. But did the demand for logs to help move the statues also play a role? Or will Hunt and Lippo's experiment deliver on an alternative explanation? At the experiment site in Hawaii, the volunteers are about to get their first lesson in moving a moai. So what we want to do first is have you do a tug of war. We want to divide you into two groups, roughly even amount of strength. The teams are learning how to work together by working against each other. Because cooperation is so important, we actually want you to be in a situation where it's really tough to win. On three. One, two, two three. three. Okay. Balancing the teams will be vital to balancing the moai in the actual experiment. Okay, you guys are a little too good. So no one team can overpower the other. There you go. Oh, come on, come on. I think we're balanced now. The volunteers then graduate from tug of war 
to balancing a 10-foot tall wooden pole. Ready? So Norm, stop. This is the maximum height we would tie the rope on the statue. Give you an idea. What seems know, easy with a 4x4 four four post may not come so quickly with a 10-foot tall, 5-ton statue. That's good coordination. Through a traditional Hawaiian blessing, everyone on site is reminded of the cultural importance of what they're about to do. A Rapa Nui ritual is also included, and everyone shares in the eating of a white chicken cooked in an earthen oven. The aroma released upon opening the oven is said to feed the gods. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you. Yeah, I do worry about the this is, isn't sharp enough, but the fact that it's got the roundedness. To maneuver the five-ton statue, a crane operator attaches rigging to Hotu Iti's neck. Oh my God, look at those cables stretching. <laughs> it's back up there. Wow. <laughs> The rigging will also act as a safety measure to prevent the statue from tipping over. Well done. Yeah, this is the real test. I know. We're sort of wondering, what if he doesn't stand? <laughs> is he resting on the ground? No, yeah, he'll fall over. Oh my god. He's gotta stand. Yeah, 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 we need to see that. Worst case scenario. It's gotta stand. It's gotta stand, that's the whole key. It leans forward because that's the way it was made. Oh my god. The statue will not stand on its own. Hunt and Lippo struggle to figure out why. Well, at the moment, you can see that the way the straps is the way it's hanging. The center of mass line here goes straight down and is, is in front of the base itself. What we need to do is get it back so that this strap is hanging from over here to get it behind this point there. Right now, the way it's hanging, it's, it's just going to fall over. It's in a leading position. Hey, what, what, what can our, you do? Our plan is to turn his truck around. He's got rubber bumpers on the very back oh, of his okay, truck. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it like that so that we can get the straps out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. Yeah. My impression is that if he doesn't stand by himself, we probably have something wrong. The ancient Rapa Nui didn't have a crane. Their statues had to stand on their own. The rigging straps are adjusted, but Hotu Iti still does not stand. Uh, at this point, I have no idea what we could do to make this work. If Hunt and Lippo can't get Hotu Iti to stand, it will be hard to prove that their walking theory has legs. The only thing you can do is either take away material in the front or add material in on the bottom. Finally, there's a solution. One more pull. Okay, go. Good, okay. <laughs> We're good. Wow. It needed that much. Yeah. It turns out that it needs just a tiny bit of help. In fact, it's a two by four that's uh, now resting right at the front of the base. And that tiny bit of addition there has balanced the moai. He's standing on his own. There's no pressure on the cables. But it may be that, that, in fact, it was always made to be unstable. When they're moving, they were carved in such a way to always be falling. And what you would do is you would add something like we did with the 2 by 4 maybe a, a stone, uh, things that we do find in the archaeological record, underneath the front to stabilize it. Along the Moai roads on Easter Island are water-worn stones like these that may have been used this way. Sergio Rapu actually mentioned this a number of times about consistently finding these sort of flat, what are called poro stones. And they're not just any old stone, they're very dense, and they tend to be really flat. You find them on the roads over and over again. We're nervously learning a lot right now in yeah. trying to do this, and that's science. It's great to be wrong, and we realize that there are a few other things that need a little more yeah. emphasis in our understanding. Before it's time to make the first attempt at moving the replica, 
The volunteers sit down to watch the training video to see how the statue should move. And as we talked about, the D shape is one of the keys. It's being leaned over to the side and then it falls forward and rocks on that front edge. And I, I think we can do it. I think we have the force, we have the manpower. So now the question is getting the details. Before they try to move Hotuiti, the volunteers need to make sure they can hold the statue upright. I want to see, figure out, like, with everybody and its height at the highest point, can we hold it back? And okay. How many people do we want? Ten, so five on each side. Okay, we need uh, five on each side, so six more people. Team leaders in the front, if it seems like you can't hold it as he releases the pressure from the crane, yell out so that we can stop and, and he can add more pressure, okay? Yeah, let's move the wood. Oh, wow, okay. Okay, so now he's going to release the tension and it's going to be up to you guys to keep it from falling forward. It's going to want to fall forward. Yell out if it's too much. Coming down. Can you feel it? Is it a lot? Oh. All right, you guys out. are holding up the statue. Okay. Now the question is going to be getting it to fall on its front edge, uh, which I think we can do with just two teams. Uh, this was always our idea, is that the teams that are pulling are actually slightly behind the statue, keeping it from falling forward while rotating at the same time. With the safety rigging attached to the statue, Hunt and Lippo finally have the chance to test their walking theory. Starting out with Team A, I want you to pull just the harder you keep it constant. Okay, See if we can exciting. rock it a little bit. Ooh. 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 OK, hold it. Uh, let's see how we're going to I want you guys to spread out a little more so that you're holding it, but more at an angle. Does this get harder, or, e or it's about the same? Easier? Easier at this angle. I want you to pull team A to pull to see what happens. Pull. Okay. All right, hold. How's that? You guys exhausted? OK. The teams continue to move farther and farther apart, simultaneously pulling and trying to twist the statue. But it's just not working. We're going to want it lower, the, the rope's lower. On yeah, the yeah, yeah, okay. Because okay. we have no leverage up there. But it looks like it's not so hard to hold it back right now. So if it's around the neck, shoulder area, you can hold it back yeah. and probably... So we'll have to it. try re roping it. As they reach the end of the day, Hunt and Lippo have to face the reality that so far, the experiment has failed. Unless they can get back on track, their failure will cast doubt on the statue-moving theory and on their other ideas about what happened to the island's once robust and productive people. No matter how this island was deforested, without any trees, wind and salt spray damaged the already poor soil. Seabirds were gone as both a source of food and nutrients that once increased the land's productivity. Some believe the loss of large trees meant they couldn't build canoes to leave the island. In one view, this is an environmental disaster leading to cultural collapse. But building on previous research, Hunt and Lippo came to believe that the islanders found a new way to adapt to the crisis. When we were first surveying here on the island, we were really annoyed by the loose rocks that we would walk over. Then we looked a little closer and we realized this was actually an area that was used for cultivation. And then on top of that, we would see uh, the taro growing in the rock areas and not in the soil areas. It was kind of backwards of what we might have expected. It confirmed what previous archaeologists believed, that what looked like random piles of rubble are evidence of an ingenious method to improve the soil called rock mulching. As you add the stones to the poor soil of Rapa Nui, you are increasing the nutrients available to plants. In addition to the phosphorus that leaches into the soil, the rocks help the soil retain moisture. If you look at uh, rock mulch across the island, there are probably billions of stones that are moved. I mean, it's just incredible how much rock has been moved and concentrated into efforts that uh, had to do with cultivation. But was it enough to stave off disaster? We have to really admire what the Easter Isles are doing, but not think that it was making their island into some incredibly productive system. It just helps to put off a worse kind of <laughs> agricultural collapse. When Pat Kirch studied the islands of Mangareva, 1,600 miles away, 
he found the same kind of deforested landscape as on Easter Island. But ultimately, the outcome for the people there was different. When you compare Easter Island and Mangareva, both of them were heavily deforested. But on Mangareva, there's a huge lagoon, barrier reef, very rich marine resources. So the Mangarevans turned to those marine resources and really depended on them to develop their economy. On Easter Island, there's essentially no reef. There's very limited coral, very limited fish. So with their backs to the wall, did Easter Island descend into conflict? The population was growing, the scarcity of resources, and a lot of competition. Social uh, conflicts start building up and tensions between group. And toward the end of Easter Island prehistory, there was a lot of war, a lot of conflict between one group and another. These sharp-edged obsidian implements found scattered across the island are often seen as the smoking gun, weapons, proof of a people at war. What I have in my hand is obsidian tool, and I think definitely it was used for uh, defense or attack as a weapon. But again, Hunt and Lippo disagree, saying these obsidian implements were everyday tools. The edge here has a lot of use wear that's consistent with carving yeah. wood, hard materials, and use with plant materials. But these implements have actually been found embedded in human skulls. I think most of the evidence that we have, it points more to use as a weapons. We have found catches of them next to a skull that mark exactly the shape of this tool engraved on, the, on that skull. The remains of some 500 Rapa Nui people have been studied to get a clearer picture of just how violent the society was. Enough of these bones show signs of injury and trauma that experts believe this was a place of significant conflict. In my view, it was a society in distress. It, it had a lot of problems. They were pushing their agricultural system very hard. I think there's good signs that warfare was periodic and endemic. This tumultuous period began before European contact, which came in 1722 when a Dutch merchant ship arrived on Easter morning, hence the name of the island. As more Westerners arrived, stories about the island grew more lurid, even incorporating tales of cannibalism. Cannibalism seems to turn up when Europeans start to talk about it a lot in the mid-19th century. We don't see any evidence like that on Easter Island. We don't see chopped up human bones. We don't find human remains in the earth ovens. There's good reason to believe that the 19th century idea of cannibalism is that you were not yet Christianized. So you're Christian or you're cannibal. And cannibal had sort of a generic meaning. So could it have been something other than violence that eventually spelled the downfall of Easter Island society? We know over and over again when Europeans arrived in the Americas and in the Pacific, they introduced disease. They did so un, really unwittingly. For example, I mean, a disease like cholera would have a devastating impact on this population because it's waterborne. And once the disease gets into water supply, it's going to be easily passed on to other people. And as they got sick, it would pass on to them. In the 19th century, Peruvian slave traders also abducted hundreds of Rapa Nui people. By 1877, ravaged by slavery and disease, a devastated remnant of the people who over the centuries had carved and moved massive moai had plummeted to only 110. But their oral history of the time before the Europeans remains a tantalizing collection, tales of warfare, ritual, exploration, and statue building. Whatever passage of our history we have, we protect it like precious information. And in our doing of archaeology experience, tell me how important it is to listen carefully to these little bits of information from our history. The oral history says the statues walked. And Hunt and Lippo are trying to figure out whether it's true. It's 9 a.m. on the last day of the experiment. Okay. Just eight hours left to figure out how to move a Moai. 
Let's be optimistic. How about there? Hunt and Lippo decide to set a goal, marking a finish line at 50 yards. We've got uh, this marked at 50 yards, 25 yards, and 10 yards. You know, it'd be great if we got it even part of that way. What we want to do is have the knot, I think, right here. Yeah. Because we want, because it's going to, we want it's the to most pull like that. Pull. Yep. After spending the morning tying, retying, and tying the ropes again, yep. it's 11.30 before the experiment teams make their first attempt of the day to move Hotuiti. Until they master the motion to move the statue, the crane rigging will act as a safety. We're going to start with the two ropes and the two large teams. We've got longer ropes this time, so there's more room for you guys to pull. You guys ready over there? Yes. So we're going to let your side go forward to let it lean forward, but you guys are going to pull at the same time, right? We're going to see if we can twist it slightly. OK. Ready, set, pull. Hey. Pull. Hey. OK, hold a hold. Hold. With no luck on the first attempt, the problem solving begins. Yeah, widen that up. That's good. OK. Go. OK, hold. OK, we got to twist it. <laughs> now we want to see if we can get the other way. Right. No matter what they try or how they move, the team can't seem to twist the statue forward even an inch. Over the next hour, the statue doesn't budge. Hey, hold! It seems to be swinging and rocking, but not moving forward. Things are exactly what we want. Uh, just have to trust in the way it moves. And if it fails, we have a crane. Trust the ancestors here. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so you're going to be pulling. Hey! They continue to try, but rocking Hotu E.T. forward and back is the best they can do. In fact, it's the only thing they can do for hours. Hunt and Lippo are convinced the ropes need to be around the shoulders to get the leverage needed to twist the statue at the base. OK, so let's get, can we get tension on the, on the statue? The... They adjust the ropes again, even taking the advice of a nautical knot expert when nothing else is working. As long as there's tension on here, that won't slip. And I think they really want the the perch is to come from right here, yeah. so it's on the shoulder. Ready? Go! The clock keeps ticking. Just three hours left to figure this out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, we almost lost it there. Oh. Hunt and Lippo struggle to understand why two ropes aren't working to move the statue forward since it worked with the wooden model. They decide to try something else, and everyone has an idea. That's what I was saying. Carl, you need to referee in this. Sure, it was a lot easier yesterday when we were up high. We did like one prong, one prong. Yeah. That's where I feel like it's going to happen. You have a rope on the top, keeping it from falling. So there's three. It's like a Y. Because pulling this rope right now is not going to work. Pulling it. So, so, so one per, so one rope up there just holding it back. It would be like one rope holding him back. We have a third rope. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Nothing's happening. It's it's basically we can move it like this, or, you know, or like this, but we can't really get it to do what it's supposed to do. So what we've done is added a third rope, which we think is going to be really critical. And now we think with three teams, we're going to be able to get the motion going, take advantage of the kinetic energy that's built into the statue, allow it to fall forward on the front edge of the moai. Uh, but team in the middle not allowing it to fall too much. As they retie the ropes, Lippo and Hunt make a new observation. Thinking back to the fallen statues on Easter Island, they remember Moai and Transport had sideways V-shaped notches where the eyes should be, a feature that now seems very important. The V-shape of the eyes and the bridge of the nose is perfectly suited for tying a rope around and creating a place that you can put ropes and have friction. It's also tall enough to provide the leverage you need to move it. Perhaps the finishing is done because that area takes a little abuse with the ropes tied up high for that leverage. And so you finish them, add the eye sockets when the statues reach their final place on the platforms. It's an intriguing speculation, but it's a little late in the day for new theories. So we're going to alternate pulling. You guys are going to be pulling back and then releasing. It's 4 p.m. 
There's just one hour left to figure out how to make this statue walk. With the 10 people in back and more people on each side, they're ready to try one last time. Release the tension. How you guys doing? Good? OK. Ready? Set. E. Oh. As the statue starts to move a few feet, it all starts coming together, and the safety straps come off. The crane is out. We're taking the training wheels off. We are going to move the statue without any help. Um, exhilarated and just amazed, really happy, and we're going to get right back to it here. Let's go for the finish line. So this is how you move a Moai. He, ho, he, ho. Once the teams get the hang of moving the statue, it becomes easy. Confident in their ability, they get a little overzealous. And Hotu Iti takes a nosedive. But there's learning even in failure. When Hotu Iti fell, he fell exactly the same way the ancient Moai on Easter Island fell. Face first, at an angle, right along the road. In most cases, when the statues fell, they weren't able to retrieve them. We've seen a couple of examples on the roads. I mean, some of the smaller ones, they probably undoubtedly propped back up. But once they got larger and larger, it became a pointless effort. Hotu Iti fares better, thanks to modern machinery. With just minutes left in the day, Hunt and Lippo revised their goal of moving the statue 50 yards. We're going to call this point at uh, 10 yards the goal line. And once we, uh, once we get there, that's going to be our finish. And we know we can move it anywhere, absolutely anywhere. Fantastic. This has been a great success. About mid-afternoon, I was feeling pretty low, and I'm pretty high right now. It moved exactly the way we thought it would. We just had to figure out how to get it started. What struck everyone was that once we got going, there was almost no effort involved. We were on the ropes, and we could feel that first tug was work. And then when it started swinging, you could feel, I mean, we weren't even pulling on the ropes. The, the energy of the statue moving did all the work, and we were just kind of gently directing it. The method, the inputs that we're doing on a 10-foot version are exactly the same that would be required in a 30-foot version. All that would matter was scaling the initial input of energy. In later experiments, Hunt and Lippo were able to move the statue more than 100 yards in only 40 minutes. They also successfully walked Hotu Iti up grades of 3 to 4 percent. We may never know if this is how the statues were actually moved, but this success presents an intriguing new explanation. It perhaps goes one step further to solving the mystery of what happened on Easter Island. What we're doing today, we're pinpointing the archaeological evidence that come from oral history, the Moai Walk. 
The transportation of the status is perhaps the most important contribution of these cultures to humanity. If this really is how the islanders move the statues, it raises an important question. Do these statues that rise above